So our speakers today are Kirsty Hassard and James Wiley, who are both curators at the V&A Dundee. Kirsty and James are going to discuss the museum's decolonisation efforts within the Scottish Design Galleries since opening in 2018, and they'll share insights gained from this process and explain how it has influenced the museum's broader exhibition programming and future planned projects. They'll also detail how these efforts contributed to the development of V&A Dundee's first major temporary exhibition, Parton. Over to Kirsty and James. Um, so thank you for joining today um, and for the invitation uh, from Christina uh, to speak. So today, James and I will talk about our experience and that of v &A Dundee's around the journey and process of decolonising the Scottish Design Galleries and how this has impacted other curatorial projects within the museum, uh, particularly the museum's first major self-generated exhibition, Tartan, in 2023, which James and I were involved in. And we'll do this by talking you through a series of case studies. So although you are hearing from um, James and I today, I should preempt the beginning of uh, our presentation by saying that a lot of the work that you're hearing about today was carried out by other colleagues within the organisation, um, particularly our colleague and fellow curator, um, Meredith Moore. So today, James and I will cover um, context, uh, the transnational Scotland network, the museums, um, and how that led into the museum's uh, decolonization decolonizing advisory panel, interpretation, commissions, tartan, um, and then what is next? So for those of you who have not been to the museum, um, v and Dundee was opened uh, in 2018, so we're a relatively young organization. We're the first v and museum outside London, and the first dedicated design museum in Scotland. Uh, the building, uh, which sits on the banks of the River Tay, was designed by Japanese architect Ken Kuma, and its formation came out of a partnership between its five founding partners, University of Dundee, Abertay University, Dundee City Council, Scottish Enterprise, and of course, the V&A. So the relationship with the V&A um, has obviously has, has immense value. It's very much our sister um, organization, but um, although we are a new organization, having a um, a foundational partner with the, the history of, of VNA South Kensington gives um, the museum a somewhat loaded history when it comes to decolonization, uh, particularly when um, you're looking to the origins um, of VNA South Kensington. Um, so, of course, the Great Exhibition of 1851 um, was key to the origin of uh, the NSA Kensington. And um, as Joshua Gray has highlighted, so the, the Great Exhibition was set up as a celebration of industry, um, an event that was aimed to display the advances made by um, technological, technological advances um, of, of humanity. However, the space of the exhibition, of the Great Exhibition, provided more than just an outlet to display industrial advancement. It was also an opportunity to display British might in contrast to the colonies and the wider world. The structure and elements of the Great Exhibition highlight the same. The building itself was a display, the Crystal Palace being a marvel of design and engineering, which housed the space of interaction. Within the Crystal Palace, exhibits which displayed British industry contained recent industrial innovations. And as a contrast, exhibits from colonial possessions contained products which were used to display difference or otherness. The India um, exhibit that you can see on screen at the moment contained materials and products that showed an element of, as Laura Kriegel designs, it describes, sorry, oriental splendour, whilst jewels and other precious goods showed an Indian domesticity to the British Empire. The exhibit for the Caribbean was also designed to show a contrast between itself and industrial Britain. Items on display included raw agricultural products, produce like sugarcane and handcrafted products. These exhibits provided a contrast, produced a contrast between the British industrial self and the other imperial colonies. The selective choosing of exhibits in the Great Exhibition structured this difference between British industrial might and perceived backward systems of production in places such as India and the Caribbean. The Great Exhibition therefore structured a space of interaction between the European metropole and colonial periphery. And from this, uh, the Crystal Palace became a space of imperial power and structured global interaction, which of course, um, impacted the development of V&A South Kensington, which um, we have inherited, so as I mentioned, a very loaded um, history. So V&A Dundee's Scottish Design Galleries delve into Scotland's design history from around about 1500 to uh, modern day. The theme displays highlight what makes Scottish design unique 
including its natural resources and patterns of immigration and emigration. The diverse range of objects showcases the extensive creativity across Scotland, uh, from weavers to furniture makers to shipbuilders, architects and digital games designers. However, these galleries don't actually necessarily provide a comprehensive account of Scotland's design history. They offer just a glimpse of a much more intricate picture. And we aim to dispel the notion that these galleries are somewhat permanent or that they, they tell the story of Scottish design, as there are countless other perspectives that could be included to enrich, challenge, provoke, and uh, encourage further discussion about what defines Scottish design in the past, the present, and indeed in the future. As a new design museum, it's crucial that we accurately represent this history within these galleries. So through collaboration, we've begun to address this by uh, revising our labels and incorporating new objects and developing a new commission work. This is a conversation that's really still within its nascent steps. Um, we're only an institution somewhat like five years old. So it's essential that we extend the conversation beyond our walls and there's still a lot of work to do in the task ahead, but um, yeah, this was what we'll do to continue that journey. So a bit of background information. Um, the Scottish design galleries were curated over a period of several years to be the semi-permanent galleries within Beanie Dundee. Uh, and I mean semi-permanent because uh, the objects contained within the galleries are all loans. Um, Beanie Dundee does not actually um, own or look after its own collection as such. Um, this gallery would comprise primarily of loans from the v in South Kensington, uh, which of course, as mentioned, there's quite a loaded history. And the remaining loans were from institutional and private collections across Scotland. The galleries were developed by v &A South Kensington and newly onboarded v &A Dundee curatorial staff. And this was alongside an advisor group in the er early development stages, comprising of representatives from across Scotland's prominent museums, universities, and art colleges. From the early development documents, it was envis envisaged that the galleries would have a relative lifespan of around five years, and would continue to evolve as new research came to light over the gallery's lifespan. As such, loans tend to vary between two and a half to five years, with the longest loan comprising the Charles Rennie Macintosh Oak Room at 25 years due to the size and complexity of the build. A primary aim for the Scottish Design Galleries was to present for the first time Scotland's contribution to and impact on global design developments. The galleries will tell the story of Scotland's fascinating design history against a backdrop of wider social, economic and political change. What is salient from early development documents is an emphasis on positive Scottish contributions to the field of design and innovation without a thorough interrogation of Scottish contributions towards empire and how it benefited at the expense of peoples and landscapes across the world. So it's only when the museum opened in September 2018 could v Dundee begin to establish its own curatorial voice within the cultural landscape of Scotland. During this period, Dr Emma Bond at the University of St Andrews and Dr Michael Morris from the University of Dundee established a research and discussion network between several Scottish museums. Transnational Scotland, reconnecting heritage stories from museum object collections, is a project that explores Scotland's significant role in global trade during the long 19th century and beyond. By examining objects such as sugar, jute, cotton, herring, tobacco, tea and linen, the project uncovered the connections between Scotland's industries and global markets. It brought together heritage professionals, academics and creative practitioners to form a collaborative network. This network aims to share new knowledge with the public through various mediums, encouraging creative dissemination methods and build a sustainable network of local museums. Ultimately, Transnational Scotland highlighted the country's rich global trade heritage and interconnectedness of people and places throughout these historical networks. So Meredith Moore, curator of v &A Dundee, established contact with Emma Bond in summer 2019. v &A Dundee hosted a pivotal workshop with Transnational Scotland Network at this period of summer 2019. This workshop brought together the academics, designers and artists to critique the Scottish design galleries here at v &A Dundee. The focus was on how these galleries address or fail to address Scotland's role in imperialism and slavery. The goal was to interrogate the existing narratives, uncover what was missing, and collaboratively forge a path towards change. 
The workshop revealed several critical insights, that many stories were left untold in the Scottish design galleries, that several objects were insufficiently represented or misrepresented, and that some ex exhibits perpetuate a sense of historical amnesia regarding the brutal realities of the British Empire and Scotland's involvement within the transatlantic slave trade. So following this workshop, an advisory panel was formed comprising many of the academics who had taken part in the workshop organized by Transnational Scotland. The advisory group consisted of Dr. Emma Bond, Dr. Michael Morris, Lisa Williams of the Edinburgh Caribbean Association, Professor Basha B. Fraser, Dr. Rosie Spooner, Dr. Suchitra Chowdhury, and Dr. Sally Tucker. From here, the advisory panel worked with the curatorial team at BA Dundee to survey the labels within the gallery space and contributed toward the rewriting of several labels within the space. So here on screen are two examples that were listed in the Guardian newspaper when the changes had been implemented and announced in August of 2020. So here are some specific examples to illustrate the changes that were made within the Scottish design galleries. So the first image here, we see a fine linen, uh, linen napkin that was made in 1762 for the domestic market. Yeah. It emitted the more prevalent coarse linen produced within Scotland's east coast. This linen was sold in large quantities to American and Caribbean plantations for clothing and slave food. The emission of coarse linen used by in plantations overlooked Scotland's integral role within this uh, element of the transatlantic slave trade. By not displaying these, we neglected the reality that Scottish industry profit, uh, profited from slavery. Then on display here is also a cap resembling a Scotch Glengarry with Indian embroidery. It might have been crafted by an Indian artisan for Scottish soldiers in the Highland regiments. An Indian regiment later adopted the Glengarry as part of their uniform. So this raises questions about cultural exchange versus subjugation or emulation of the colonizer. The third image displays Khartoum Cathedral. Khartoum Cathedral was designed by Scottish architect Robert Muir Schultz. This cathedral in uh, Sudan was described as a blend of European and Middle Eastern architecture. However, we admit, it omitted that it was built two years after Khartoum's violent conquest by British forces, symbolizing uh, British Christian rule in an Arab Muslim city. Schultz's design had clear political purposes and its architectural style was a tool of political symbolism that wasn't referenced in the label. And finally, Scottish design firms use global trade networks to push Scottish exports into British colonies, undermining local economies and artisans. Turkey red fabrics produced in Scotland often appropriated Indian motifs like peacocks and buttas to be sold cheaply in Indians for saris. By flooding the Indian market with cheap Scottish produced textiles, Scottish firms actually undermined local craftspeople and distorted traditional cultural expressions for commercial gain. So in tandem with the label edits that were then made in the Scottish Design Galleries, uh, we collaborated with four of the members of the advisory panel to produce an introductory video to the Scottish Design Galleries. This was filmed and produced remotely over the se uh, second COVID lockdown of February 2021. This film explored the editorial process from different perspectives and how we changed the labels. We heard from Emma Bond, Suchitra, Sally and Lisa Williams who described their personal and critical responses to objects within the galleries, asking what defines an object as an object of Scotch design? What episodes of an object's biography could be prioritized? And was the object part of an economy of exploitation, such as colonialism or slavery, or directly and or indirectly? And so when it came to lessons learned from our development of the Scottish design galleries and the redevelopment of the labels, uh, although we had reevaluated and reappraised the interpretation within the Scottish design galleries, uh, in, a, in reflection, we, uh, we also in effect whitewashed the displays by not taking on accountability that the labels had in fact been changed within the gallery space. Future visitors to the Scottish design galleries would not have been aware that the previous version had existed unless they'd come across the press articles pointing out labels in question. Furthermore, beyond the introductory video, there was no explanation or rationale on what was changed and why. So learning from this, an approach such as what is proposed here by C. Harman Mood, Museum of Empire Project Researcher, will be a better practice for any future ed edits of existing labels. 
by including the previous text in the re-exhibit, displays acknowledge and take accountability for any previous glorification of empire while correcting the language used in display and recentering the narrative instead. As part of any future development of the Scottish design galleries, we will see that the previous labels are acknowledged and interrogated within the gallery space, whether from increased space or for label text or via an accessible app such as Smartify. The former would be preferred as the latter creates a hierarchy of access to information and in doing so obscures institutional accountability. Other than interpretation within the Scottish design galleries, it's also possible to activate other areas um, as part of the, the decolonising journey and process. There's an area for commissions. Um, the inaugural one that you can see on the screen at the moment was entitled Plain and Ornamental of Every Description, designed by Glasgow-based graphic designer Maeve Redmond. And it was designed to respond to themes within the galleries, but particularly to think about the internationalism of Scottish design. Maeve chose to focus on Walter McFarlane and Co., a Glasgow cast iron manufacturer who is represented in the galleries via a trade catalogue. This was commissioned for the opening of the galleries in 2018, prior to the first decolonisation project that James has touched upon. But in many ways, um, it can be seen as a precursor. May have cited in an interview that it is important to acknowledge how Scottish design industries benefited from and were integral to the global trade routes established through the colonisation of the British Empire. By extracting the marketing language of the company, we can see how they operated within the global, social and political issues of the day. McFarlane's understood their market as a modern company in the most contemporary sense. And in a, a further um interview that, that she gave, she said it's important to recognise what design industries like McFarland's were built upon and what exploitation of power may have taken place to make their global impact possible. Capitalist structures born from the Industrial Revolution created a top-down hierarchy in the design industry. Scotland's abundance of natural resources were utilised and people were drawn to cities through job opportunities. While the exploitation of the empire and resulting dominance of the markets gave British companies the opportunity to be successful internationally, Investigating the impact that the empire had on industry is essential to understanding how we can um, and must work ethically. And its um, its successor, um, and apologies for the quality of this slide, I didn't realise when I was putting the presentation together, but um, its successor was focused on, on the context um, of Dundee. And for those of you who haven't uh, been to Dundee, this is a slide that it, yeah, is referencing that context. So Dundee is a port city whose fortunes, particularly in the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries, were centred on its waterside location, um, which is obviously quite close to where the museum is sited today. But crucially, much of its fortune came on its relationship with Jute. It was called Jutopolis um, because of this. So the museum uh, commissioned artist, curator and writer, uh, Swapna Tamhain, it was inspired by archives held at the University of Dundee and Verdant Works, um, which is a, a museum that focuses on the history of jutes um, within the city, to create a commission entitled The Golden Fibre, uh, which you can see at the moment. Her research explores the colonial context of jutes and the lives of workers in and around Calcutta, which, which in the 19th and 20th centuries was known as Calcutta under British imperial rule. Jutes was known as a golden fibre because of the huge profits that were made from it. Though those profits were rarely shared with workers in Dundee or what was then British ruled Bengal, which is now split between Bangladesh and India. In the 19th century, workers in Bangladesh and India harvested raw jute to be shipped to Dundee for processing and manufacturing. And in the early 20th century, they worked in mills in and around Kolkata that were mostly managed by, by Scots. That shift is seen as helping to accelerate the decline of the jute industry in Dundee by moving manufacturing closer to the source. So the commission that you see is a collage of archival photographs and drawings of female workers, as well as microscopic images of jute paper that the artist made by hand. This laborious process involves cutting up jute cloth, soaking it in caustic chemical lye, and then beating it in water for hours to create a pulp that is then shaped and dried into rough sheets of paper. Part of the work is an installation called um, You Don't Speak Bengali, I Can't Understand Anything, and then we have it um, Bengali language. It features extracts from a Hindustani language exercise book used by Scottish supervisors to control workers in the Bengali mills. Colonial attitudes are revealed through translations of orders such as hurry up, keep quiet, do not waste oil and do not make any noise. 
The work explores how colonial, how the colonial uh, system connected workers from across the continents. And so hand tools used in the Dundee mills and factories, including a bale hook, hackle, portagoge, and pair of weaving scissors from Verdant Works, um, are, and they're also on display. So we're able to take forward the lessons of 2019 to 2022, Davini Dundee's first major in-house temporary exhibition, Tartan, which opened in April 2023. Firstly, and I worked with our colleague Barry Maxwell and consultant curator Jonathan Fairs, and uh, we produced a show covering 300 objects across five themes. Through its interpretation, the exhibition was able to delve into the complex intersections of Tartan with the histories of slavery and empire, showcasing how the iconic pattern is connected to broader narratives of Scottish identity, colonialism, and global trade. The exhibition highlighted its role in military subjugation of populations across the world through Highland regiments and pulled out key documents of primary evidence linking the textile to the transatlantic slave trade. These latter objects were displayed in tension alongside the heavily romanticised objects connected with the Jacobite rebellions, questioning visitors whose histories are recounted and whose are omitted. By platforming Indian Madras textiles in East African sugar cloth, we also wanted to project to audience that the woven checker textiles are not solely a Scotch phenomenon and should not be reduced to sentimental phrases such as tartan being Scotland's gift to the world. It was important for us to ensure rep representation across the whole exhibition, ensuring tartan's global history was told. This was also, this was important for its history, but also important for its contemporary presence, um, particularly within the modern fashion industry. Um, and its importance to contemporary designers. So we engaged and commissioned the fashion designer, Olive Thomas, um, who was born in Lagos in Nigeria, um, brought up in Glasgow, he moved to Glasgow when he was three years old, and he's now based in London, and he created the installation that you can see on screen at the moment, which was entitled Intersectional Family. And Olive when quoted said, for me, tartan means kinship, it means family. You bear a mark that identifies you. Through each line, each width and each colour, your own personal narrative is constructed. It tells my story and symbolises my journey and my experiences to the complexity of my cross-cultural identity. The tartan was woven by Scottish micro mill Vevar, um, based in Glasgow, and by the um, weaver Kirsten McDougall, um, who's based in Hastings. And it acts very much as a cloth that both constructs and deconstructs identities for those coming to Scotland from divergent cultures. Olive dressed the intersectional family in uh, the, the green and white tartan, which is a colour scheme um, that's very close to his heart because it's a colour scheme that's shared by both the Nigerian flag and Glasgow Celtic Football Club, which was his football club of choice when he um, moved to Glasgow, um, reflecting the designer's cross-cultural identity. The family's copper masks, designed by Olive and his collaborator Holly Vaughan, symbolise the commodification and economic value of enslaved people. We hover above the ground in reference to the legend associated with the Scotland-owned West African slaving station, Bunce Island. This, tells, this story tells how the King of Sierra Leone, when collecting rent from the Scottish tenants, was drawn on land, drawn on land by boat for fear that if his feet touched the ground, the island would sink. And behind the family, you see a, a tartan or a, a cloth um, that's made from recycled fabric, a dynamic reworking and transcending of old material and indeed cultural stereotypes into new forms. So the success of the exhibition really was owed to an advisory panel composed of a diverse range of backgrounds and cross disciplines. Namely, when comparing the initial advisory group in the Scottish Design Gallery's decade previous, it wasn't a panel of white faces solely involved in academia or the museum sector. So if I'm to apply a critical lens to my predecessor, Savini Dundee, I think this is a contributing factor to where the Scottish Design Galleries possibly fell short in addressing the empire and connections to slavery within the galleries when the museum first opened. So one of the main challenges to sustain decolonial practice is constraints on time and resource as it can always be a resource intensive process. Securing adequate funding and resources is essential for sustaining these efforts. And museums privileged in the fact that VNA Dundee managed to secure 2.6 million in capital funding toward redeveloping the free offering at the museum, namely the Scottish Design Galleries. Through funding for a capital project, it offers the opportunity to reevaluate the objects and collections on loan to the museum while also working with communities 
to co-curate a, sh a showcase of Design Connect Scotland that addresses historical injustices and fosters a deeper understanding of shared histories. The unfortunate limitation to such funding is that it requires to be committed within a certain time frame. So this is a risk that could be leading to short termism. Recruitment will be underway uh, for this project in the coming weeks. So I'd encourage anybody looking to get involved to reach out or get in touch in addition to checking out the careers page on Vina Dundee's website. And of course, undertaking this work's not easy. Any resistance to change has mostly become apparent, in fact, through our audiences. And as the work is supported across the organisation at all levels, from the board to front of house colleagues, we sometimes have to navigate difficult discussions with visitors. However, there is encouragement from across the cultural and political landscape in Scotland today. The Empire, Slavery and Scotland's Museum Steering Group published recommendations in 2022, and it was a toolkit for museums to take on board. Meanwhile, the exhibition, Curating Discomfort, produced by Zandra Yeoman at the Hunterian, really set the bar of best practice within the sector of Scotland. The display focused on the museum's colonial past and its role in perpetuating structural racism. Its curatorial approach was composed of provocative inter interventions aimed at promoting critical thinking and questioned the neutrality of the museum itself. The curation also involved collaboration with community activists, social justice campaigners and educators. Such collaborations were essential in ensuring the narratives were inclusive and representative of the communities affected by colonialism and slavery. Curating discomfort embodied everything decolonial practice should be. It was human-centric, democratic, self-reflective, critical, and active. So our experience of working through several projects, such as the Scottish Design Galleries in Tartan, reflects a broader ongoing effort to embed critical reflections within the wider museum's practices. Though we're still really in the early stages of that journey, we hope that by collaborating across the sector via networks such as Transnational Scotland, and putting resource to good use such as capital funding, will promote a more inclusive and honest representation of design history in Scotland at VNA Dundee. Thank you. Yeah, looking forward to putting it up to questions. Great. Thanks, Kirsty and James. That was really, really interesting. Um, we've got one question in, in the Q&A, um, and I've got a few others, but I'll just give people a chance to, um, to have a think and ask a few more. So our first question is from my lovely colleague, Patricia, at the University of Liverpool, who's, um, who's asking, is the gallery open to the public? Um, do you charge an entrance fee? No, uh, no entrance fee. So yeah, it's it's the kind of main free offer um, at the museum. Um, so in terms of the sort of structure, kind of overall, I guess, exhibition structure at v and Dundee. So we, a lot of our efforts, a lot of time is um, towards exhibitions. Um, as James mentioned in his presentation, we don't have a collection. Um, so we've got a couple of, um, our, yeah, so our focus is, is on our exhibitions programme. Um, so Tartum is a major one of um, 2023. Um, and Kimono, uh, the Turin exhibition from v and South Kensington is with us at the moment. And then an exhibition called um, Photo City um, as well. But yeah, it, the kind of basic answer to your question is uh, it's it's a free, the Scottish Design Galleries um, have been the kind of major part of that free offer um, for visitors who are coming to the museum who aren't want to pay for a, uh, to, yeah, to see an exhibition. Yeah. And that will continue as well into the, um, through this sort of redevelopment and so on. Yeah, it would, it would always be the major um, free paid offer. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I've got another question from um, Lena. I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this right, but Bose. Um, saying, thank you so much for the lovely talk. I'm wondering if you could say a bit more about reception. Have you done any studies on impact of your exhibitions and decolonizing efforts in the galleries on your visitors? Or do you have any anecdotal evidence in terms of reception? So what we tend to do with the temporary exhibition program and in doing so, it also ties into a lot of the semi-permanent sort of free offering of the museum is that we conduct surveys um, through Scott and Form as well. So typically, if, um, you know, somebody's been to the museum or indeed been to the temporary exhibition, they'll have a form either set out or there'll be a member of staff on hand within the museum who 
we'll uh, sort of talk through what their expectations were visiting the museum and then um, some of the reflections that we left with. And um, I would say with, with the Tartan exhibition that uh, one thing that we were getting through quite a lot was how much the section where we really addressed slavery's connection with Tartan, how, how salient that was and how often that was represented within people's responses. Um, so it was definitely something that people were really moved by and picked up. And I, I think it was actually down to the fact that um, even though we had these original documents and letters, we also had this really stunning film called 1745, which um, really kind of unpacked this uh, story through a contemporary lens um, by two uh, Nigerian sisters, the Candy sisters, produced a 15 minute film and it's honestly like a, a moving Lancier uh, painting. And the, the main plot line is that uh, it's two escaped enslaved people running through the highlands and they're both wearing tartan dresses. But uh, that, so that's how we sort of looped that into the, the overarching narrative of the exhibition. Um, but it's also one of those opportunities where art is the, one of the greatest ways to actually unpack these stories as well and unpack uh, yeah these narratives. But um, so I'd say there is the responses through yeah through Scott and Form uh, of what the impact is of any sort of curatorial changes we make in the galleries, um, we can sort of track on, in a, in a qualitative sense, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you. So we'll be able to take all of that feedback on board. You know what we've what has been effective um, and what hasn't been as effective and. Yeah, I think every every exhibition, every project that we do is very much, uh, yeah, it's, it's a learning curve for us. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, I've got another question come in. Um, so do the speakers have any tips about developing and sustaining collaborations as part of the decolonisation process? And do you have any advice to those who would like to engage in similar activities but have a limited budget? Yeah, I think um, I think you're speaking about engaging people. I think it's I think what really helped us um, with the decolonizing advisory panel. I think also by extension of that, because we did a separate um, advisory panel for the Tartan exhibition as well. So I think how we were able to effectively um, introduce that content was the fact that it was integral to the exhibition from from the very start of of the curating of it you know we wanted to tell those stories and and those um those sort of global histories um as we were speaking about i think it's um i think what we found really effective is just ensuring that i think communication um is key so um frequent updates um with your panel and um, ensuring everyone has like the correct information and I think you know ensuring that everyone is kind of brought along on the journey um yeah and also just yeah. reach out and actually seeing what networks still exist you know within your sort of local you know local sort of cultural landscape in a sense yeah absolutely um, yeah you know it was just a uh, very much happenstance that you know, Dr. Emma Bond and Michael Morris were setting up Transnational Scotland yeah. as we had just opened at the time because it was really this new kind of testing ground then to sort of uh, feed into. So, yeah, don't, uh, I guess one thing, don't don't be afraid of going out and kind of asking for help because that's essentially what we did. Yeah, when we absolutely. First opened. Yeah. Um, reached out to Emma Bond saying, you know, we've, you know, just opened. We would really like to see this reappraised. And even so, with um, approaching then uh, Zandra Yeman as well, who curated uh, curating discomfort at the Hunterian, again uh, was uh, a case of we reached out saying that you know this is work that we want to fully embed within across the museum, and you know do you have any tips to sort of get going and get the sort of the ball moving? And she's been a really great supporter throughout as well. So. Yeah. yeah, I think that um, what Jesus is referring to there, but I think that idea of 
if you do have a limited budget, yeah, it's absolutely looking at you know the looking at your your local environment um, and making it super like site specific. So you know, talking to like your local university and seeing what research the academics are doing there, and kind of try and make these um, connections to that. It doesn't need to be something that um, you know, it's something that you don't need like loads of budget to do. Like absolutely. Yeah, I should add, add sort of speaking to your local universities is a good idea because I know, um, especially like at our university, academics are often looking for partners. Yeah, so yeah they'll absolutely. Be, yeah, they'll be really keen to sort of hear from other museums and organisations. Yeah, and we find that so effective, um, like partnering with, with academics, yeah. Brilliant. Um, We've got a couple of questions that are similar, so I'll kind of group them together. But we've got um, questions about if you could just tell us a little bit more about how you involve local communities in the um, the rewriting of labels. So what kind of people or groups were involved, what sort of budget you had, um, and how the stakeholder engagement will be sustained in the longer term. So with uh, when it came to rewriting the labels, um, we were really, I guess, leading into the sort of the academia within Scotland, I would say, yeah. um, established by Transnational Scotland, um, and that you know that's one way to sort of move forward with um, sort of rephrasing and sort of co-curating and co-creating labels. Um, but then you also yeah have the approach of what's been undertaken by curating discomfort at the Hunterian, where it's very much yeah elements of the community of that have come involved through social activism and I would say that um, this is something definitely in the future that we would like to explore as we develop the Scottish Design Galleries because yeah we've really only taken the small steps through Transnational Scotland and the advisory group there so it's really about opening up that conversation further um, and really engaging with uh, the local communities within Dundee as well um, which uh, the diasporic communities in Dundee according to the latest census, you know, have grown uh, from something like 7 to 10%. And I think that's reflected across the Scottish landscape as well. Yeah, we've so, got, um, it isn't maybe necessarily present in our labels, but our, um, we've got an amazing um, learning and engagement team. Um, who the exhibitions team work with really closely, and there's a group called the Amina Group that the, um, are learning, or um, one of my colleagues deals with communities specifically. And it's a group of, I think it's refugee, Mm. Um, and they've done work um, around picking particular objects and sort of relating like personal connections um, to them and that's um, available on our website so though it's not available within maybe within the museum space but yeah it's sort of available within um, the museum resources but yeah as James says that's absolutely something that we'd look to work upon when yeah when as kind of further work is done in our Scottish Design Galleries. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, we've got another sort of question in the comments about how do you share the decolonising work that you're doing with the public? So other than obviously the exhibition, how else do you kind of share what you're doing? I think it's mainly through our website. Um, we have a, when we first started doing the decolonising work, which I think became sort of present to the public in, uh, yeah, in, in 2020, we put a statement um on our website uh, um, is outside the galleries as well, actually. So if you come to the museum, you get this statement about what our intentions are um, with our with our decolonization work, which is basically to massively paraphrase it. But it's basically, you know, we're, um, you know, we're a quite young museum, and um, a lot of the work that we're doing probably should have been done before we opened um, in twenty eighteen. So it's a kind of like writing the writing the wrongs, um, a lot of it, and very much saying, you know, we are. On a journey and it um, is um, a process and so on. So that's very, I think, um, I think you're very, very aware of that because it's in a very, very public space um, within our museum. But other than that, yeah, I would say our website also, um, it's very much a part of our public programme um, as well. So we do talks um, and events and so on um, that aren't just linked to the Scottish Design Galleries. I just say they're linked to, I think, because obviously when you start in a process of decolonisation, it's um, really important to embed it across yeah, your yeah, the entirety um of your public program um you know across every exhibition um and so on and yeah in terms of public events and so on we yeah ensure this um 
a part of that as well. So yeah, we told that there was an awareness amongst the public of the work that we're doing. Brilliant, thank you. And just while I wait some more questions, I've got a few questions. So mm -hmm. obviously you said there's a lot of work kind of ongoing um, and there's other projects planned. Can you just sort of talk a little bit about some of the learnings that you've had from this project and how you'll maybe sort of develop that or implement that? I can see that, um, yeah, when it came to the learnings of it, it's that um, certainly with Tartan, it was kind of the, the first thought that would come to mind when we were developing the interpretation was actually, you know, it was really about applying that sort of critical lens to every object we were looking and selecting with of, you know, how does this connect or potentially connect to colonial enterprise in a way, you know, and that's how there's a whole then theme around tartan and power and yeah. how then that connects to empire and transatlantic slavery and i guess it's actually just you know question and being very sort of reflective before you know you've you're sure set on a, a particular story of an object um i think that yeah that's one of the main sort of takeaways like yeah having a story in mind and actually questioning you know is that is that the correct story and who's affected by the story and yeah who's omitted by that's by seeing that story as well. Yeah. So that's something that's really come to light um, from, from working on this. And in fact, from inheriting then the, the label change project at the Scottish Design Galleries as well. And um, because Meredith really did all the development work before um, before I started in the exhibitions department here, but then um, I, I just joined when we were then sort of executing that in practice and then installing them within the galleries. So even just actually taking that on at that, stage was um it really helped kind of focus and uh, the way i work anyway so thank you yeah i think as james said it's really drilling down into object histories um and as much as possible you know ensuring that you are telling the correct story um, of that object and its origins and it's it's yeah it's it's global history so i think that's the main yeah, main lesson I was, I've taken from it, which has informed um, ongoing curatorial practice. Yeah, and even so, just how we've brought in objects, in fact, to the yeah. Scottish Design Galleries since uh, that label mm -hmm. change as well, like the, the coconut cup, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we brought in, so we did, our, um, yes, we sort of mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the Scottish Design Galleries are very much um, an ever evolving, uh, ever evolving gallery because um, we're, we have we're, we're kind of we've, we're kind of um, basically that the objects are um, the objects are on display are sort of in line with um, various institutions and um, lender agreements. So yeah, as we said it's like five years, two and a half years, or, which means that yeah, you rotate objects on a semi regular basis. And we did a large uh, a large scale rotation in November twenty twenty three. So not really that long ago, like six months or so ago. And one of the new objects that we brought in um, is a coconut cup. Um, so yeah, as as the title says, uh, a coconut that was um, supported by by silver and, and turned into a drinking vessel, um, which was a massive commodity. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the reasons why these coconuts came to the UK and uh, why they were such a prized thing was because of the um, East India Company and the sort of various shipping routes. Um, and yeah, as with all the other objects that we've. Um, look to the interpretation of we thought it was really important to, to tell this story as well so that was another example of um reaching out to get expertise so we spoke to dr michael morris again part of the advisory panel who's an expert in, in drinking vessels um as well and we're able to get his expertise on how to tell the story of the object thank you so i know in the um the presentation you were talking about like there's different sort of guidelines on how to do things and you're saying you know some of the subjects obviously can be quite triggering did you provide any training for like the front of house team um on how to kind of handle that because they're there the front line yeah i mean when we first installed the labels in august 2020 um we had conducted some uh several workshops in fact with the front house team as well to not only sort of walk through the changes that had been made in the galleries, but also, you know, potential trigger points as well for, um, uh, you know, positive conversations, but also 
you know, ones that are going to be quite difficult as well. And I do believe, you know, there were several conversations that had arisen, but um, throughout all that process it, in these workshops, it was then stating, you know, to front of house staff, you know, we're absolutely with you on this. And if there's anything that you feel distressed by, or if you need to speak to us as well within the exhibitions department, you know, do reach out as well. And then we can sort of work on how we sort of can sort of almost build together a toolkit on how to sort of guide those conversations as well. Um, one in particular that comes to mind, in fact, was when we initially first redeveloped uh, the display on, on jute weaving within the galleries, weaving on the East Coast. And in fact, how we had, in fact, positioned and platform uh, the riots, the, um, the Indian workers who then grew the jute and had omitted the mentioning of... Um, of actual Dundonian factory workers, that actually was one of the major sort of, I guess, flashpoints you could say for conversations. Um, but then once we were able to sort of explain that with our visitors, that in fact, by including both within, you know, the same sentence of saying they faced hardships, you're actually creating a almost like a false sort of equivalence there. So in fact, it was it was really a tough decision to say what story do we tell in fact we decided to tell uh, the transnational story Ed. Great. thank you a uh, couple more questions have come in so the first one is um what was the most challenging thing that you faced when um acquiring transatlant transatlantic slavery objects what was the most challenging thing I guess for, for Tartan, um, it was really actually about how how we tell the story and actually how we frame it as well. Um, so for context, for Tartan, we had two letters. Both were connected to um, Tartan's connection with the transatlantic slave trade. One letter was um, essentially... Um, a Glasgow merchant wanting to order tartan to then um, uh, import it into South Carolina for uh, the Charleston market there. And it used um, racial language within the document as well, of which we had a trigger warning for. But also then the other document was actually more upfront in saying that it was a Scottish plantation owner who wanted to employ tartan to then use within his own Jamaican plantation. And um, what we really saw with that is it really frame it framed it as you know these major developments and these horrific acts happening to enslaved populations, and there wasn't really any representation of the voice of the enslaved and their modes of resistance as well. So as part of that, what we also uh, had done was we uh, brought two examples of a runaway uh, article that was uh, put in the press in Britain and it was the same individual who had um, uh, resisted and ran away from their uh, situation uh, not once but twice and on both occasions were in Tartan as well and we felt that was really important to, to show there were people you know going against that and not just ha having things happen to them essentially um, so I think that was that was actually quite difficult as well as how, how we'd sort of worked through that and made sure that we are, you know, not just saying that, you know, this is what happened within the transatlantic slave trade. I think also as well, it's all about the things that you you don't have. So there's very, very little um, surviving material culture that tells a story of people who are, who are caught up um, within those, those systems, so enslaved people. So... Um, you know nothing like the, the the clothing itself doesn't survive um so it's basically i think one of the challenges is how do you tell those stories without you know the material culture that you might have to tell other stories and um yeah those letters are basically the only thing that uh, the letters and uh yeah the the adverts are the only thing that basically tells um those stories mm -hmm. um and then i think it's also like what is not said in those letters and in those um adverts um as well so like the, the like 
I think a lot, it's very, very loaded language, but I think the kind of true horror basically being brought up of, of being in those systems isn't properly fully communicated. Um, yeah, and in, in, in the kind of surviving material culture. Yeah, and that's um, so, so, yeah. really part in the fact that, you know, yeah, no fragment survive yet. Across the way, we had a different display of, you know, Charles Edward Stewart, and it's just yeah. like, you know, small talismanic fragments galore because that's the history that people, you know, decided that the, there was worth in yeah there's value in yeah value so in, yeah. it totally ties to the whole you know history of collecting as well and you know why why things survive and why things don't survive and so on and, and so forth yeah brilliant thank you i think we could have a whole other discussion on this yes <laughs> yeah, <totally. laughs> so minefield yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um Last question that's come in is, are there any plans to change the Scottish galleries in the next couple of years? Yes. So, yeah. So um, as James mentioned in the presentation, um, yeah, we've got a quite large chunk of funding um, and there isn't a strict timeline um, on it yet. But I think work is going to start around about 2026 um, mm -hmm. on that because obviously, the, yeah, they might have really nuanced research um, into... Yeah, like redisplaying um a gallery is, is immense. So yeah, I think we're definitely taking a lot of considered time um and you know working at what what stories to to tell and what objects to display um and so on. But yeah, 2026 is what I've what I've heard for a sort of start to it. Yeah. yeah, just connect with that as well. Um with that funding that's connected to the project, we'll then have recruitment as well to go alongside that. As well, so that's yeah. the point. Then. Yeah, yeah, watch the space. Brilliant. We've got one more question come in, which I probably have to be the last one, just conscious of time. Um, so how did the collections you have come to be in VA Dundee? Yes, yeah, so we don't strictly speaking have um a collection, so the museum itself doesn't hold a collection, um, but we we borrow from from other collections, um. The main one for the Scottish Design Galleries is VA South Kensington. So I think two thirds of the two thirds of the objects in the galleries are from VA South Kensington, um, which of course has its own very yeah, loaded histories um when it yeah, when it comes to when it comes to decolonizing, um, which meant that for the vast majority, I think, of the labels that we've done decolonizing work on, those were all from the collections of VA South Kensington saying this and I think that's true yeah mm -hmm. um and for the other third that's a complete mix so it could be um other national museums um like National Museum of Scotland for example um local authority museums within Scotland um designers uh archives a, a big a big mix basically but yeah the the large the largest component part is uh, is being a second 